Hey, hey, friends. Thanks so much for tuning in to this online gathering of Redeeming Hope. I'm so glad that you guys are tuning in with us as we're continuing to walk through the season of Advent with our sermon series, The Christmas Cast, Seeing Jesus Through Their Eyes. And we actually take a significant amount of time and energy as a church over this Advent season to kind of slow ourselves down and remind us of the truth of the gospel. And so we've got a bunch of great resources for you. I'm actually going to orient you to those resources here in a minute, but if you got your cell phones with you, which I do, um, you can pull them out and go to ourhope.cc slash advent, and you'll have access to all of our resources that I'll walk us through in just a second. So before we get to that, I want to remind us of our vision. Redeeming Hope, we exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. This means that we want to be faithfully following the life and teachings of Jesus, but we want to be really open to wherever you might be on your spiritual journey. So thank you for joining us today. And every year as a church family, like I said, um, we try to set aside time to focus on the advent or the arrival of Jesus. And the word advent means coming or arrival. That's literally what that word means. And, And we celebrate this. We celebrate the arrival of Jesus coming into the world, but we also celebrate his fulfillment of his promises. And so it's not just the fact that the baby Jesus was born, but it also was that it was he was born in the context of thousands of years of prophecies that promised us a savior who will save us from our sins. And not only that, but we also celebrate Advent looking forward to the future when Christ will return and set the world right again because we know he fulfills his promises. And not only that, but we also embody the waiting that the world was waiting for for thousands of years, waiting for a Messiah. So over the month of December, we want to be in a posture of waiting. Even though Christ has already come, we want to kind of reenact that waiting period that the world had for so many thousands of years. And so um, as we kind of think through this, Advent reminds us that Christ has come, that Christ is here, that Christ will return, and that he has come to satisfy our needs. And so there's a few ways that we want to help encourage you with this. So again, you can go to ourhope.cc slash advent, and there you're going to find a couple of resources. The first one is our 2021 Advent Reading Guide. And so that's just a once a week thing. So you grab some candles. Um, We teach you about how to light Advent candles um, in this little two-pager, right? You can just put it on the front and back of one page or print it out. And then what you do is just read a few verses, just a few verses from the Bible. Read one simple paragraph that asks some questions at the end. So we encourage the heads of household to gather their families together, maybe around your, your kitchen table. Um, grab five candles and each week light an additional candle and then on Christmas Eve light the Christ candle, the one in the center. And then you do this little devotional. It's just once a week. It could take about 15 minutes. Also, if you would like a daily Advent devotional, um, we actually give you access to that. So we'll send you a book called The Dawning of Indestructible Joy by John Piper, which is just from December 1 to December 25th um, uh, devotional for you. But then That's also available as a PDF as well. And then we also have an explanation, a simple one-page explanation of Advent on our Advent website. Um, And and we also want to encourage you, you can join us and watch these sermon series as well to prepare your heart for the coming of Christ. And again, all of this is done just to slow us down, to be intentional with our time. My friends, I was thinking about this last week. You know, we maybe get 80 Christmases in our life, right? Right? You know, you think about the average person living about 80. Yeah, you get about 80 Christmases, and you get a lot less that you can be intentional with, right? When you're a kid, you're just kind of doing what your parents are doing, so you got to cut out all that childhood stuff. So maybe you get 60 Christmases. Don't waste them. Enjoy them. Celebrate them. Use them to thrive in your walk with Jesus. Use them to remember his coming. And I guarantee if you do these things, if you take a little time to be in the scriptures, that God will speak to you through them and you will have a meaningful Christmas this year, meaningful Christmas season. So again, that's ourhope.cc slash advent. Also, I want to give you some ways that you can reach out to us as I do every week. 931-326-4512. You can text us. You can email me, josh at redeeminghope.org. You can join our church discord. Also, 
I'd like to encourage you to contribute to what God is doing here in Clarksville. He's doing amazing things. Actually, we've got some amazing plans for 2022 that we're going to be sharing in the new year. Um, some We're going to go back to meeting weekly at the YMCA. And we would also like to encourage you to contribute for this past year of 2021. So you can go to our, uh, you can go to redeeminghope.org slash give, or you can find us on Venmo at Redeeming Hope. And just to let you guys in on this, we're not worried about this. We're trusting in faith that God's going to provide for us, but we're about $7,000 behind our budget for this year. And we, we think more than likely it's because of COVID and, and we weren't gathering together and people weren't able to tithe in person like most people like to do. And so we're asking people to consider a special year-end gift to help us get in the black for 2021. So um, we've had people in our church already commit to some year-end gifts, and I'd like to encourage you to pray and consider that as well. Thank you again for joining and engaging with us. So as we continue in our Advent series, The Christmas Cast, Seeing Jesus Through Their Eyes, um, today I want to begin our time by talking about a church-wide ski trip. Okay, when I was a kid, um, there's nothing more exciting for me. It was one of the most favorite events of the entire year was to go on the youth group ski trip. So here's what we do. It was the end of January, right? So I was excited about Christmas, but I was really excited about the youth group ski trip when I was in middle school and high school. And so we, we'd pack some, some clothes, right? We'd get our CD players, okay? And so I had an anti-shock Sony CD player that still worked when it was left in zero degrees, right? We'd get our pack of CDs. I had like a little wallet of CDs. We'd carefully choose, all of us, so we didn't double put a CD in that somebody else might have. And we'd put all of our CDs in there, and we'd get these big headphones, and we'd get into this huge, we get in a couple 15 passenger vans that were incredibly dirty. Every, every single thing you touch, I don't know how this is possible, but every single thing you touched was sticky, okay? And they were probably extremely unsafe. And we would take the long trek like eight or nine hours north into upstate New York from Bowie, Maryland. Okay, and so that, that towards the end of the trip, you'd get McDonald's for breakfast, we'd get McDonald's for lunch because we were, we were teenagers and we loved McDonald's. And then we'd get up there and then we'd be climbing up this mountain, okay? That's what it felt like. And there was a few times where we actually got stuck and we all had to jump out and like push the van um, out of a ditch. It was so much fun. And we get to like this, this hotel and I swear to you, the, the people that organized this only reserved two rooms, one for the boys on one side of the hotel and one for the girls on the other side of the hotel, okay? And we would pack like 15 or 20 teenage boys in like with two double beds, a pull-out couch, people were sleeping on the floors, people were flipping coins to see how many people they could fit in the two like queen or double beds, people were sleeping at the foot of the double beds, it was bonkers, but it was so much fun. And when it started to get cold, I started to get excited, okay? So it, it was just this anticipation, weeks of planning what CDs we're going to bring, talking about it, going on the ski trip for a few days. It was a joy. And so I want you to think about teenage Josh, all right, anticipating this ski trip and the excitement that I felt in the weeks prior. Maybe you have a similar experience. Maybe you've anticipated uh, a special event in your life, right? And I want you to think about that as pertaining to Advent this year. That's what we're doing in this season. My friends, we are reenacting in the month of December what humanity went through for thousands of years waiting on the coming of the Messiah. And so today, in the Christmas cast, we're actually focusing on an old man. He's a righteous man, a faithful man, who had been waiting. He had been waiting for the arrival of Jesus for many years. Look with me at our text today, Luke 2, starting in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit to the temple. 
And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. This is God's word. Now, we are introduced in the early parts of the book of Luke to four songs that are surrounding Jesus. And actually, Simeon's quote, when he grabs the baby Jesus and he looks up to heaven, he's celebrating what, what God has done, is actually a song, uh, one of four songs in the book of Luke, cha- Luke chapters one and two. And so um, we see, we're introduced to this old man, Simeon, in the first two verses. Now, there's only two verses about Simeon. We, we don't really know a lot about him outside of this. There's some extra biblical tradition, but um, we know a few things. And we're actually going to put that text back up on the screen here, Luke 2, verses 25 and 26. And it says that there was a man in Jerusalem. So we do know that's, that Simeon lived in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And it was actually, uh, I was thinking about this the other day, it was actually a tourist destination. It was actually a, a pretty great place to live if you had to live in a city. It had modern amenities brought in by the Roman government. Um, but then it also had one of the seven wonders of the world, which was Herod's temple. And so he's able to worship in the very temple that King Solomon built on the very steps that King Solomon built. And so so we see that Simeon lived in Jerusalem. And it's really, I'll tell you, these two verses are jam-packed with information about Simeon. The next thing we see is that he's righteous and devout, right? And so it's very interesting that it says it here because there's actually, it's, there's very few places where the Bible actually calls a person righteous and devout without a caveat to that right? But there's no caveat for Simeon. And so a few other people that are referred to like this are are men like Job in the Old Testament and the Gentile centurion Cornelius in the New Testament, righteous and devout. So we see that Simeon is first a man of character, right? So we know where he lives, but he's a man of character. Next, it says that he was waiting for the consolation of of Israel. Now, when you hear that word consolation, um, it, it's, it's a little difficult to understand without actually diving into what the, that word means. And it literally means to, to call to one's aid. It's to call for help and then to be comforted when that help arrives. It's actually a really complex word, but if you break it down, it's just to say, hey, I need help. And when that person comes to help you, you experience that comfort, right? So that is what that word consolation is. He was waiting for for the coming of of God's answer, right? For the Israel's cry for help. And he's waiting for the comfort of Israel. So we see that not only was Simon Simeon a man of character, but he was faithfully believing that God will come to save his people. He is waiting for it. He's trusting that God is going to come and save his people. The next thing we see, which makes Simeon very interesting, is it says that he is filled with, with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's, what's fascinating is that before Christ, okay, before Christ died on the cross and the, rose again and the church was started, um, all in the background of human history before that, the Holy Spirit would only come on certain people for certain tasks and could be taken away because of sin or because of other circumstances. And so that's why David, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, um, prayed in the Psalms. He said, take not your spirit from me. Now, post-Jesus, after Jesus, um, you and I get to experience the Holy Spirit's permanent indwelling within the heart of a Christian. But, but it says here that Simeon was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's rare that the Holy Spirit would stay beyond a specific thing. But we see that Simeon has a special filling of the Holy Spirit. He has a special filling of the Holy Spirit in his life for this waiting. We really believe that. And then finally, it says that it was revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Well, the, word, the word Christ means Messiah, means the, the coming one, means the coming Lord and Savior who is going to save the people. And so we see that Simeon had a special promise from God. So he's a man of character. He's faithfully believing that God will come to save his people. He has a special filling of the Holy Spirit, and he has a special promise from God. My friends, 
Um, I, I, I want to take a little bit of liberty here because Simeon was, from all what we understand from the text and even some extra biblical literature, um, very old. Okay, he was very old. He was actually said when he saw Jesus, now I can die. That was the first thing he said. So, so he was probably very, very old. And, and people thought he was probably a bit mad, a bit crazy. He was continually hoping, continually trusting, continually waiting, watching for the coming Messiah that had been prophesied for thousands of years. And, and, and this guy Simeon thinks it's going to happen in his lifetime? I mean, thousands of years of prophecy of this future Savior that's going to set Israel free from sin and spiritual oppression? Uh, and Simeon thinks that he's not going to die until he sees that Messiah? Can you imagine if he told somebody that? They'd just probably look at him like he was crazy. But we see that one day, one day, Simeon felt led by the Holy Spirit that was indwelling him. One day he felt led to go to the temple. And what we saw was he saw the person of salvation, which is Jesus. Look with me at Luke 2, verse 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now are you letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. My friends, Simeon felt led to go to the temple and he sees Jesus and he knows immediately that this is who he's been waiting for all these years. The time has come. He has arrived. So I, I wanted you to take a little bit of, of maybe, cre- allow me to take a little bit of creative license with this, okay? Because the text doesn't tell us exactly what's happening, but more than likely, um, it, was a, it was a hefty task for Joseph and Mary eight days after the baby Jesus was born to get to Jerusalem and go to the temple. They had to offer certain sacrifices on behalf of Jesus and on behalf of Mary, both for her purification and Jesus, the baby Jesus' dedication into the Jewish faith. And so more than likely what happened was is that Joseph and Mary traveled the day before and they stayed with some family members in the city of Jerusalem or near it. And I just picture, just for a second, just picture with me, old, decrepit, gnarled hands bent over Simeon praying in the temple for the consolation of Israel. Can you imagine him praying, seeking God? And then he turns and he sees Joseph and Mary and this baby coming in early to the temple. Maybe there's nobody else there. Maybe it's just the four of them. And they're coming here early in order to go and offer, begin to offer the sacrifices. They want to make sure that they're there. And can you imagine what he feels in that moment? praying for the consolation of Israel, this old man. For years and years and years, he has faithfully waited. God's spirit indwelling him, God's spirit leading him, him trusting in the faithfulness of God, being righteous, being devout, praying consistently, offering his sacrifices. And then he turns to see the sacrifice that would end all the sacrifices. Can you imagine the movement of Simeon towards Joseph and Mary? Can you imagine the confusion that maybe they must have been feeling? Although they've already experienced so many amazing things happening, angels in the sky, shepherds finding them on the night of Jesus' birth. They see all of these things happening. Mary still recovering from her birth. The baby Jesus just eight days old and Simeon runs over and he takes Jesus in his arms. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what Joseph and Mary probably was saying to themselves? Like, what in the world is this guy doing? He's trying to steal our baby? He's so old. He's going to like die tomorrow. How can he take, he doesn't want to steal a baby. But then what he does is he grabs the baby Jesus and he immediately starts singing a song to God. Now, how interesting is it that he looks up to sing this song to God while he is holding God himself in the second person of the Trinity? in his hands. He's singing to God while holding God in his hands. And this song that he sings is called the Nunc Dimittis. 
That's in that's the, the Latin phrase um, that's traditionally called uh, the Nunc Dimittis is the song that he sings, and that is Latin for the first three words of his his speech, and it literally says, "Now let me depart." That's what he says. The first thing that comes to mind is, "I can die now." When he sees Jesus, and you'd think that maybe that wouldn't be what he would think. So, so that leads us to believe that maybe he's very old. His life is long. He's been waiting. He's weary. He's ready to go home and be with his father God. And what we see is that I think there's a two ways to break up this song. There's a first section and a second section. And the first section is the song of Simeon for Simeon. It's the song of Simeon for him personally. Look with me first. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. There's something about the arrival of Jesus that gives Simeon such a peace that he's now free to die. He's now free to go be with God. He's now go free to rest in peace. There's something freeing when he sees Jesus for Simeon, just for him. Then he says, according to your word. Those are such crucial words in his song. Absolutely critical to us understanding this. Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of God's personal promise to Simeon. Think about this. This is a thousand years, okay? This is the Old Testament, okay? The Old Testament right here is littered with prophecies. This covers thousands of years of human history that God was going to fulfill, but yet God loved Simeon. God loved this one man. He gave this one man a special promise just for him, just for his heart to wait for the coming of the divine. Do you see what that tells us about our father? Do you see what it tells us about how he loves us? that he can have a promise that expands for thousands of years, that he expands all the way back into the garden and he promises there would become one that would become that would crush the head of the serpent, right? And yet he gives this one man who's a nobody. He's not a priest. He's not a Pharisee. He's, he's just a normal dude in Israel. And he gives him the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that no one else in Israel was able to have. He gives him a word of knowledge and prophecy that no one else seemed to experience except just a few people, right? And then he leads him to the temple and fulfills this prophecy for Simeon. And you and I get to be the recipients and the observers of Simeon's promise fulfilled. That just tells us so much about the heart of God for individuals, not just epochs of human history, but also for individuals. Finally, we see, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And my friends, I think that, this is both a transitional phrase, but I think that Jesus is the embodiment of Simeon's salvation. This was personal for him because he goes on to talk about the salvation of Jesus is for the world and, 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 and global. But I honestly think that Simeon has been waiting to see his salvation. And that's what gives him the hope that he can die well. He can die secure knowing that he's going to his father in heaven because he's seen the hope, the consolation of Israel. He's seen his salvation. So the song of Simeon is for Simeon, but also the song of Simeon is about Jesus and it's really about Jesus' global movement of salvation to the world. The next phrase he says is, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of, of all peoples. And so what he's saying is that Jesus is coming to save all peoples. All peoples are going to observe this salvation. And then he says this phrase, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So he says that Jesus is a light to the Gentiles and he's glory for Israel. Now, what's fascinating to me and what tells me that Simeon was a student of the scriptures, And maybe it was because he was such an astute student of the scriptures that God entrusted to him with such such a beautiful gift. But in Isaiah 60, there is clarity, there's there's a prophecy 800 years before Jesus that in his song to Jesus, holding the embodiment of the salvation of the world, 
that Simeon calls back to. Look with me at Isaiah 60, starting in verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you and the nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. It's a prophecy of Jesus. Now let's read now again the, the last part of Simeon's song to see the comparison. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You see the themes there? You see that? See, in that Isaiah text, God is talking to Israel. He's talking to his people. And what he's saying is, is that there's a darkness over all the earth, but God's glory, the beauty of all of who God is, the beauty of God's perfections, that's what God's glory is. The beauty of all of who God is will come within Jerusalem says he's going to rise upon you. He says he's going to come to you, Israel, right? And from that glory, a light will explode with brightness that will draw the entire world in. That that light won't just be for Israel, but that light will be for the salvation of the entire world. And so, so what we see is that that there is a light dawning as a result of Jesus' glory, that Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. He was born in Israel. He's in Jerusalem at this very moment that Simeon is singing these words eight days after Jesus is born. And he is the glory of God come present to us. And then that glory becomes a light. And what Simeon could never have known, because he died probably shortly after this, what Simeon could never have known is that 32 years after holding the baby Jesus in the temple, Jesus would say these words. And again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We see 800 years before Jesus, Isaiah being written. And then we see fast forward 800 years to Jerusalem, the fulfillment but then we see 2,000 plus years from Jerusalem to Clarksville or wherever you are today. It's all to bring the light of life back into our hearts, the person of salvation. It's to bring Jesus. And so we see his father and mother in Luke 2.33. They marveled at what was said about him. Now, my friends, this story is amazing. And if we ended it here, we would see that Jesus is the promise fulfilled, right? We would absolutely see that for sure. And it would be a very easy thing for us to say that the lesson from the sermon is be like Simeon, right? Uh, trust, hope, wait, be faithful to God like Simeon was. Pray and hope for whatever God's promised you and God will reveal himself to you in time and you will experience all of his goodness eventually, okay? So just wait and hope like Simeon. But my friends, I don't think that's where we need to land. And I don't think that's what this text is saying. Because, you see, there's one more striking moment between Simeon and Mary that we need to address. And I purposely did not read that at the beginning of our time today because it actually changes the tone. It shifts the tone of Simeon's excited, joy-filled prophecy. And then it actually goes, cuts right to the sobering reality of Jesus' arrival, Jesus' advent into the world. And this next text also helps us go deeper than just trust like Simeon to really the heart of the gospel in this passage. And this final section is called The Cost of Salvation, Everything. Look with me at Luke 2, verse 34. So this was right after Mary and Joseph marveled at these words that Simeon spoke. And, and Simeon blessed them, right? He blessed both of them. And he said to Mary, so he turns to Mary, his mother, he says, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Now it goes from this beautiful, joyous Simeon 
grabbing Jesus, taking Jesus in his arms, singing him a poem, singing a poem to God while he's holding the God of the universe in his hands. He turns, Mary and Joseph marvel. He probably hands them baby Jesus back and he blesses them and he says, you're, you're going to be blessed in your life. And then he turns to Mary and says these sobering words, serious words. He speaks a prophetic word to her that is totally different than the tone that we've been looking at so far. The first thing he says is, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And what that refers to is the falling of many refers to the the religious Pharisees, the, the Jewish people who thought they had it, the Jewish people that had studied the law night and day, understood it front and back, but they missed the God of the law when he showed up. They missed God himself when he was right in front of their eyes. And those who missed Jesus will fall under God's condemnation. So it's saying that Jesus has come to expose the false religion, the false idolatry of even his own people, right? But then it says he is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And my friends, the the humble the faithful, especially the Gentiles, because we're seeing that Jesus' salvation is not just for the Jewish people that God had chosen, but it's accessible to everyone. Those humble, faithful people who believe and follow Jesus will be elevated to become sons and daughters of God. So the falling, the condemnation of the Jewish people that thought they got it right and the rising of all, both Jews and Gentiles, who faithfully, humbly follow Jesus to be risen to be called sons and daughters of God. But that's a sobering thought to think that there are some who now we see are going to oppose Jesus. It says a sign that is opposed. Simeon says that humans will resist Jesus. That for many, Jesus will not be a hope of a promise fulfilled, but rather they will actively work against Jesus, ultimately opposing him to the point of killing him. He will suffer the pains of rejection and opposition. And he tells, Mary this, he says that Jesus is going to be opposed. And unfortunately, he was opposed by his own people. And finally, he says these incredibly sobering words, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. That word also means that he's referring to a sword that's going to pass through Jesus. And in doing so, that sword will also pierce Mary's heart. And my friends, this is clearly a reference to when Jesus dies on the cross. And a Roman soldier, to ensure that Jesus is dead, Roman soldier pierces his side. Look with me at John 19. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. Now remember, Mary, his mom, was at his crucifixion, observing every second, even when all of Jesus' friends abandoned him. And I wonder if Mary, in the hours following Jesus' death, after his side was pierced with that dirty, dusty Roman sword, I wonder if she remembered the words of Simeon if she remembered the prophecy of so many years ago of the suffering that she would experience. See, the cost of salvation, it was global for Jesus. He took on the weight of the world for us. The the Bible says that he died for the sins of the whole world. He says that in, in 1 John 2. But we also see that the cost of salvation was also very personal for Jesus and his mom. Jesus had to watch his mom, and he even speaks to his mom while on the cross. And only one of Jesus' disciples that was there at his crucifixion after all the rest of them abandoned him uh, was John. And And he tells his mom, behold your son, turning to John. And he tells John, behold your mother, meaning that John was to take his mom in and care for him because Jesus knew that he was gonna send into heaven eventually. But in that moment, he was caring for his mom, but his mom's heart was breaking as she saw the suffering of her son. So the cost of salvation was global for Jesus, but it was also very personal, both for Jesus and his mom. My friends, this is the truth, that Jesus came to die for the faithless. He came to die for the ones who are opposed to him. He came to die for the ones who put him on that cross. He came to die for the ones who doubted him, His own disciples doubted him. 
He came to die for the weak and the struggling and the poor in spirit. My friends, Jesus came to die for you and me. Because when we really look, that's us. There are times we believe, there are times we have faith, maybe there are times we don't. There are times that we struggle, times that we doubt. Jesus came to die for you. And he's already anticipated every need that you would ever create because of your sin. And he resolved it on the cross. My friends, Jesus came to die for people like you and me. As I was, as I was researching the sermon, there's a, a new hymn I discovered just this past week. And the title is, O Come All You Unfaithful. We're going to put the lyrics on the screen and I'm going to read them for you. It says, O come all you unfaithful. Come weak and unstable. Come know that you are not alone. O come barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come. See what your God has done. O come guilty and hiding ones, there is no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. O come bitter and broken, come with fears unspoken, come taste of his perfect love. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. My friends, the light was given to us because darkness reigns in our hearts apart from the light of Christ. We are in the kingdom of darkness and we need to be transformed into Jesus' kingdom. My friends, the glory was given to us because we are inglorious. We don't reflect God's attributes. You see, Jesus was born to die, fully anticipating your sins, your weaknesses, and your lack of faith. And this is the hope of Advent, is that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. Now, if you're joining us and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you, Jesus is ready. Jesus is waiting for you. He's already resolved your sin. He's already dealt with it. All, all you have to do is receive his free gift. You have to hear this message. You have to believe that it is true for you, that you have a need that Jesus needs to meet. And then you humbly make him Lord over your life. And when you do that, you become a Christian. You become a follower of Jesus. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, I want to assure you that, that Jesus has saved you. But do you run from him? Do you run from him whose side was pierced for you? My friends, Jesus draws you in. He knows all of your sins. And not only does he fully know you, but he fully loves you enough to die for you before you were even born. He's known about you since the beginning of time. And he has chosen to become a man, chose to become a baby, chose to set aside all of his heavenly rights. He chose to become a man to suffer, a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief, as the scriptures say. He did it for you. He loves you. And he wants to offer you this free grace today. And not only that, if you're a follower of Jesus, he wants to offer you this free grace again and again and again in every area of your life until the day you die and see your Savior face to face. As we conclude today, I want to read you a little passage from 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He has shown his light into your heart. He wants to invite you to continue to let that light shine and penetrate every area of your life until you reflect Jesus more completely. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, just a reminder, go to our website for um, ways to give. Go to our website to help us understand Advent. And, um, and I thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Take care, bye.